okay, you want a methodology. They don't have one. Your sales organization was doing this. Now you want them to do this plus this plus this plus this, right? So behavior change. You're going to ask them to do things in the system that you're not asking them to do today. All things that salespeople in general rebel against. They just don't want to do that stuff. And so yeah. I'll ask this question. Ultimately, I'll ask them this question. Do you have the stomach for it? Because it's nice to say, it's nice to want to do it, but unless you as a management team are going to own this and drive this, it will not work. Welcome to the Modern Selling Podcast, where we help the entire sales community to create more sales conversations with today's modern buyer. This includes anyone from entrepreneurs and business owners to sales reps and sales leaders. Each episode, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you find, engage, connect, and nurture your relationships with your buyers. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., your host, and you're now listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm super excited to have with me my man, my friend, Mr. Steve Maxwell, the head of field enablement at Datrium. And oh, by the way, one of our newest clients. So I want to thank you, man. Steve, this is actually funny, guys. I love talking to folks who have actually been following our sales podcast, the Modern Selling Podcast, for I don't how long you've been following us for? Two years. Oh man, that's almost the entire show. That's almost the entire time we've been yeah. in, in production. I, th I think I've listened to everyone, but I think I started listening on like number 12 or something. There you go. Look at that. So this is, you are officially my first guest who has listened to every podcast that we have had. Nobody else can say that, man. Thanks for joining us here, Steve. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Mario. So do me a favor, man. Give us a little background about yourself, field enablement, where did you come from, how did you grow up in sales, all that good stuff. Yeah, it's funny. I am a dying breed and one of very few native Silicon Valley people, it seems like anymore. So I'm born and raised in the Bay Area. Got my start in sales because I had a goal in life not to work at all. I wanted to be a professional athlete, played soccer in college, but either I wasn't good enough or the old North American Soccer League disbanded when I was in college, so I didn't have a place to play. And so I figured, oh, I got to get a job now. And I kind of fell into it. I was always entrepreneurial, uh, had my own you know, business when I was in college, you know, simple things, but I, you know, I, Hey, I'm going to do my own thing. Cause I, I got to make money. I have to be able to make money in my own time because I was worried, you know, school and soccer and doing all these things. And I kind of was a natural seller cause I was selling myself to provide a service to customers, et cetera. And I just kind of fell into it and then ran with it and just learned how to sell. Um, I started really selling in my second job out of college at HP and uh, uh, just learned the, the process of selling and what it took to be good at it consistently. Uh, and then I got promoted to be a manager pretty early on. And then kind of my whole view of, of selling changed as I became a sales leader. And in part, because I had a whole bunch of people who thought I was too young and not experienced enough. And so I, my motivation for being a, a seller or an effective seller changed too, to be, I am not going to give anybody any ammunition to think I, he wasn't ready or he didn't deserve it. So that's kind of how I really got into the, the science part of selling as well. And now as head of field enablement, what does that include? Is that just sales enablement or give me an idea? At Datrium, field enablement is all sales roles. And I think the whole function of enablement has changed. My first enablement job, dating myself now, back in the mid-90s, when there wasn't really any such thing as, as enablement. And it was part of marketing, actually. And we, we did sales training, uh, which is kind of how most enablement things have evolved, right? You, know, you needed to train your salespeople. And, you know, the IBMs and the Xeroxes and, and the PTCs are kind of famous for for effective selling. We had a training 
function as, as part of that. And I was on the data side. I was like, how are we going to mine all of this information that we have to give to our sellers to be more effective at their job, how to target the right people, how to understand who is going to be at the account uh, that you need to be able to address and position our solutions to, et cetera. Then it's became more about communication and productivity, and, and it's evolved now into this whole field that we call enablement now. And I, there's a lot of practitioners that I've, you've had some on your show. There's been lots of other podcasts around enablement. There's the whole sales enablement society now. It's a function that has become a lot more strategic over the past decade. You know, I've been a part of, of that wave and I you know, know so many of the practitioners uh, now that you know, we all were kind of our own little group beyond the sales and society itself. I remember you just rewind back four years ago and the term sales enablement was like at its infancy stage. And now we're like thousands upon thousands of, of roles and people inside of this particular segment, which is extremely important to the success of a sales organization. And we like to think of it as just oftentimes people put training inside there. And it's so much more than training. In fact, as we were laying out our 2020 strategies and plans, we were going through process enablement, sales pitch decks, qualifying questions, cadences, training and development, onboarding, tools and technology. I mean, like you're the technologist, you're also an executioner, a strategist, you're thinking of how to integrate with marketing, you're thinking of, you know, how you get out in the field level, how does a sales force get impacted by salesforce.com or other tools like HubSpot as an example. It's like just very large role that ultimately goes back down to, in my mind, as really helping make sellers more effective at selling. Yeah. And, I, and I look at it the same way. I, I look at sales enablement, and, and I've always had this mantra, and it's shared by many of, of my friends in the space, is that sales training is an event. Yeah. But sales enablement is an outcome. If you're a sales leader who thinks, hey, I need to train my sales team, then you look at it so narrowly and then you don't think that you can have an enablement team or an enablement function that's strategic to you. You just think of it, hey, I need you to train my team. But then that helps the sales enablement team then think, hey, as soon as I train these people, I can just tick that box and I'm done because I'm no longer right. tied to the outcome. I was just told I needed to train people. But if right. I'm not linked to the outcome of them actually learning and taking on that information with which you're training them, and they don't actually get better at their job or more deals, faster close sales cycles, more people hitting quota, then it doesn't really matter. Right. I've always tried to work with my sales leaders, marketing leaders, and even you know executive team on what's possible and how what if you have truly an enablement function in your in your organization, the value it can bring to your sales team beyond training. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we got so carried away into this topic here, you and enablement and all that. I forgot to ask you like, oh man, tell us something nobody would know about you, even if they looked at your social profiles. I want something juicy, man. Yeah. Um, so something juicy? I don't know if I got juicy. Um, <laughs> I, uh, if it was juicy, I, I might not be invited back. Uh, uh, I am a Bay Area native and uh, it's funny when I when I do a, a new hire class or something, you know, I was you, know, you have a group of people from all over the world come in and and you ask, hey, give me something, you know, an interesting fact about yourself, and then I'll always caveat this like, or an uninteresting fact about yourself <laughs> if you don't have any interesting facts about yourself. So and I was like, for the uninteresting fact about me, it's like I have lived my entire life in terms of permanent residence within five miles of the house I live in today. So that's that's an uninteresting fact. I guess the, the other thing that you wouldn't see is, is I, but I've traveled the world. I have been to 50 countries Wow! Um, and I have a goal in life to get to over a hundred. I've got a ways to go, but I will get there. You're halfway, halfway through, through it. But the unfortunate thing is I'm probably more than halfway through my life. So I've got to accelerate the, tra the travel. You plan. better chop, <laughs> chop to it, baby. Chop, <laughs> chop to it. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's interesting. Actually, your whole entire life, other than college, was with you five miles from where you grew up at. Yep. Apparently, you like to stay close to home, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, growing up in Silicon Valley and being a part of this, there hasn't been a, a big need to want to leave. Things happen here, right? There's entrepreneurship, there's job opportunities, there's exciting things that happen. And then, of course, there's the weather and I'm an outdoor guy. I play a lot of golf. I used to play soccer, as I mentioned, but I play a lot of golf now. And some years ago, I, I made a run at thinking I could qualify for the US Open. 
uh, and I came just short, missed it by a stroke. That's something that nobody would know, if, even that's if they looked at your social profiles. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one right there. Is I, I'm a better than average golfer. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like that. I love it. Uh, let me switch gears here for a second. You're certainly qualified to talk about this subject, especially heading up all of field enablement for Datrium. I want to spend some time talking about sales methodology. This is a hot topic, I think, for a lot of organizations, given the fact that we have so many underperforming sales teams. Generally speaking, the CSO Insights identified that there was less than 60% of sellers achieve quota on year-over-year basis, and it keeps going down and down and down, right? So oftentimes, we look at sales leaders and they're like, we don't have a sales methodology. We need to be able to use a sales methodology to become better at selling. So talk a little bit about from your perspective, looking at sales methodologies, when should companies deploy them? How do you choose them? And I suppose I'd say, how do you make sure that they're rolled out successfully so that they deliver on the promise that they're supposed to give? Yeah, that's a great question because I've encountered selling methodologies back in the late 90s when they first started to come vogue, right? People say, oh, we, you need to have a methodology. And there were a number of them out there, but there was a common theme in all of them. And there still is a common theme. I still think that at their core, their sales 101 type stuff, right? It's core selling best practices that enterprises have been doing for years. Uh, but back in the 90s, the way that they would get rolled out is that you would run your sales team through a training class for a couple of days. They'd get a nice binder uh, with this is how this sales methodology works. In the class, people are like, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, I like that, you know? And they might pick up right. a thing or two that they didn't know or that they got lazy about or whatever. And then they would come back to their office and they'd stick that binder on their shelf and they would never open it again. Yeah, uh, yeah. It couldn't stick, right? When I was at BEA Systems back in you know, late 90s, early 2000s, we recognized that phenomenon and we customized a methodology. We brought in a consulting company that helped us understand, well, what's already working in the organization today? And then what are some of the elements of a methodology or, or, or these methodologies that are out there that can resonate with your sellers? And then we created our own and that worked. And so I, I saw that. And then when I left there and I went to Borland Software, we had to retool the entire company because of competitive you know, situation. We competed against IBM. They had made an acquisition and we weren't prepared. And so we had to make a bunch of acquisitions and we had to retool the entire sales force. And so we did it again that when I was there and we created a different approach to selling using some of the methodologies that were out there. And we cobbled together that what's going to work here. And then we rolled that out and that was successful. If I, but if I say that, you know, there are lots of methodologies out there and I've used lots of them. There's one common thing that has to happen is that the company has to be ready for it. When I went to ServiceNow, ServiceNow was, was, had just gone public. It was still a pretty fast growing organization, significantly smaller than it is today, obviously. But while the whole time, I was there for almost two years. The whole time I was there, we didn't have a formalized sales methodology. And this kind of leads into the how do you make it work? So the how do you choose and how do you make it work part? You need to choose a methodology based on kind of how do you already operate and which of the methodologies, if you want to espouse a formalized one, kind of fits in with how we already sell today. And then how are you going to reinforce it? And the reason it worked for service now for so long without one is because everyone understood, especially the sales leaders, how we sold and what were the key things that we needed to accomplish. We had a sales process that was documented with steps and here's, you know, your discovery and qualification and then your technical win and then all, you know, all the various sales stages so that you could forecast and all that. Everyone understood what that was. And we knew how to sell. We knew what our message was. We knew who we targeted. We knew what we needed to do. So we didn't need to have a formal methodology. Then as the company got bigger and there became hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sellers branching into different lines of business with different kinds of use cases that, okay, now you need to kind of be able to codify a lot more other things because it's a broader scope. So in every organization I've always been into, and asked to do this methodology thing, it's like, okay, well, what is happening? Interviewing salespeople, interviewing sales leaders, how are we working today? And then you find the one that fits best to support that. And then to making it work is, it is so much about 
constant reinforcement. You have to change the language that you speak. We add the language into the opportunity records in Salesforce. We talk about MedPIC as our qualifying opportunity qualification approach. Those words are in the opportunity record. That's the way we do deal inspection. That's the way we train. That's the way we talk. And then sales leaders are expected to coach people that way and to talk about how we talk about the value framework. So we, we are proponents at, at Datrium of force management's command of the message as an approach. And so we talk about the value framework and we talk about the value-based conversation and the current state and the, and the positive business outcomes and the required capabilities, all of those things that are key elements to executing that core methodology, we talk about in everything that we do. And until you do that, it's going to have random or less often successful you know, implementation. I think that's one of the big challenges that we've seen. And one of the reasons why we made such a dramatic shift and change even at Vingresso is, is training has always been an event, right? It's two days, generally speaking, oftentimes get everybody together for two days or you put them through a class for two days. The reality is, is that they're only going to retain less than 30% of what it is that they learned. And then they go right back out, which you said, they take that book and everybody used to talk about, oh yeah, we have the big book and they get to have the intellectual property and they can refer back to the book. And I know if I look back at all my books, they're sitting on the shelf and I haven't pulled them out, just like you said, right? So it's very interesting you say that because that was very similar approach to when we formed Vingress and we brought all these companies together. Everybody was delivering out a training event and that training event was, you know, over a course of a period of time, maybe five weeks or so, and they were handing out little cards and this and that reminder stuff. But the reality is from our perspective, if you think about how people learn, we learn from a methodology perspective and I'm talking about how we learn to transform our behavior from doing this to actually having a, a methodology to help move that opportunity down the sales pipeline or to assist the buyer in the purchasing process. The reality is, is the way we learn is the exact same way we've always learned, like in school, like go to college. We went to lecture, we studied our books, we went to professor office hours or GSI office hours, and then we tested, right? That's, that, that's exactly how we learned, but it was all done over the course of time. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big challenges that we've seen in the sales training space is that we always talk about events. And that's why we, from a Vingresso standpoint, while we have many sellers who say, oh, I could have done this in, you know, in a two-day training. Yeah, probably so. You could have done that, but you only would have retained less than 20% and you wouldn't have executed. However, if you do this over the course of time and we throttle you back, meaning we hold you back before you can get to the next step. Why? Because we want to make sure that through reinforced coaching, which is what you talked about, reinforcement, that you actually have mastered this lesson, this item, this action with actually putting into practice. You know, there, there's something else you said in there about the training event and, and people, hey, hey, I've got my two-day class and, and they focus on trying to solve the wrong problem. They, they say, well, I need to make my training class better without even realizing that that's not the problem. The problem is that the science doesn't lie about adult learning and how much people retain and for how long without the reinforcement, you, you learn by doing, to your point. And that's one of the reasons why, as the quick ad for Vangresso, one of the you know, reasons that we really wanted to bring that in is the approach. It's not a training class. It's a systematic approach over time that changes behavior because that's the only thing that's going to change the behavior. I mean, the, I can't remember some of the stuff that I did last week. Yeah, um, exactly. And it's like, if I'm supposed to teach that or I'm supposed to make sure that this and say, like, okay, well, how, how do, but when I'm in the moment, I'm like, yeah, I'll remember that forever. And then I forget it, you know, like in the matter exactly. of Exactly. As I think about sales leaders and having been a sales leader and a managed a, a very large book of business myself personally and a team, one of the challenges that I think we have today when talking about sales methodology programs, enablement programs, period, is getting buy-in and ownership from sales leadership, right? Yeah. And one of the big challenges, we looked back at our senior leaders at Vingresso just met and we talked about our 2019 business blunders. We actually made a list. We made a list of our 2019 business blunders. And we're calling them just that, business blunders, things that we made mistakes on that we needed to fix for 2020 for improvement, okay? And what we saw in terms of the data set was that we spent a lot of time trying to convince leaders, in our case, of this thing called the internet, that it really does exist, right? 
And that happens whether it's our enablement for digital selling enablement, you know, sales training program or any other enablement program that you're looking to roll out. Technology, could be training, could be methodology, could be process, cadence, whatever it might be. A lot of sales leaders aren't necessarily bought in. They're not bought in to ensure the success. All they're looking for is, did you prospect? Did you talk to someone? Did you get out there? What's your latest that you've got? And we always go backwards. We always go back to what it is at the old process of how they used to think, what they used to ask, what they grew up with. So how do you get buy-in and ownership from sales leadership to ensure success of enablement program? That is the $64,000 question, right? Oftentimes, sales leaders are thinking about quick fixes. They're thinking about if I roll out a methodology or I teach people negotiation skills or pick your thing, then that's going to solve the problem. And how I've always done it is, as an example, I always I can go back to my consulting days um, when I would go to a, to a company and who, who would you know, ask me to come in to talk to them about enablement. Or they talk to me about, hey, it's a CEO just hired a new you know, VP of sales or a chief sales officer or a new chief sales officer comes in who, I, who I've known or whatever, comes in and say, hey, we need to implement a methodology. We need to build an enablement program here. I would start my own discovery process, right? I'm, talk, I'm asking them questions about what challenges do you think you have? What problems do you think you need to solve? Blah, blah, blah. You, know, you, you kind of go into that. And then ultimately, it comes down to a very, very simple question, at least from my perspective on, is this going to work or not? Is okay, you want a methodology. They don't have one. Your sales organization was doing this. Now you want them to do this plus this, plus this, plus this, right? So behavior change. You're going to ask them to do things in the system that you're not asking them to do today. All things that salespeople in general rebel against. They just don't want to do that stuff. And so yeah. I asked them this question, ultimately I asked them this question, do you have the stomach for it? Because it's nice to say, it's nice to want to do it, but unless you as a management team are going to own this and drive this, it will not work long term. Right. It might work for six months and you might see some benefits, but if you don't own this on an ongoing basis and change the way that we coach, same, change the way that we reinforce, change the way that we talk about it, it will not work. If you want this you have to do it. And then I you know, give them all sorts of examples. And part of my value to them as, as a consultant at the time would be, I've done this in these other 10 places. And this is what I found. This is what I learned. And then I'd have you know, references. And I could, I could come in with some credibility to say, this is not just me saying this. This is proven over and over and over again. If it was a consulting, I wouldn't do the work unless they said, okay, we're going to do this. There's a couple of ways to do it. You can mandate it. You can be the autocratic draconian, hey, if you don't, then you will not be here or you will, we will fire you or you, unless you document this, don't document this way, we're going to withhold commissions and that kind of stuff. That only works a little bit. You bring everybody along with, this is how it's going to benefit the organization because we can show you how it's going to make conversions of conversations to opportunities, to deals, to value, to renewals, all those things better. If you do this, because there's evidence, right? We're going to measure right. this. But even with that, as an enabling professional, and I'm sure my colleagues listening would be able to reinforce and you know, give us head nods is, yeah, but that's also not a one-time thing. You've got to constantly work with your frontline sales leaders to make sure that they're in it and they're buying into it constantly and you're reinforcing it all the time and highlighting the successes because just like anything else, if you don't highlight the successes, then people think, well, it's either already second nature, which it usually isn't, or it's not working. So I can just go back to doing things the way I used to. So it's interesting you say that, especially that last part, the successes, because I hundred percent agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why even within our own program, we have a couple things. We have what's called a success discussion forum and we publish a weekly playbook of successes of all of our clients and every week of all the new stuff that's coming in from all the different sellers for the very reason of trying to make sure that we are bringing to the top different levels of successes with different items that they may be absorbing so that others can learn from it and see the results as well. Because seeing the results helps a lot because, it's, and this is where we as enablement professionals and practitioners you know, in the audience is, you have to go a little bit more 
of the extra mile as the enablement person in the room and communicate, especially if it was like a new methodology. If that was kind of the focus of the thing, then I would make sure that we had a customer win template that's written in that methodology's language and that every new logo that came in, we talked about in that language and then communicated it out. If it's, you, you, we're, we got some new messaging that's focused on that methodology or we did, we did some negotiation skills training or whatever that is, then you just brute force highlight those wins to communicate to everybody else that this is working because that extends the honeymoon period where people are willing to buy in. If you go silent, then people go back to old habits really, really quick because salespeople in general especially if they've been successful in their past. And most of us, the organizations that we work in today, they're like, hey, we're a pretty good organization. We have really cool technology or we have a really good product or a really good solution. We can command talent from people who have been successful. So if you get that, then salespeople are really good at selling at least one thing themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to come in and they hey, I, I look at my W2, look at all the th- great things I've done. So why should I listen to you about doing something different if I've been so successful? So, and they'll buy it for a little while because I'm new to the company. And so I'll, I'll, I'll play ball. But then as soon as that, all that stuff goes silent, it's like, oh, well, I'll just keep doing what I was doing before it worked before. They have to see based on evidence that it worked before. Then you have to make them own it and be a part of the program itself. The and delivery. Front, delivery. Frontline and frontline sales managers are the linchpin. If you can support them and coach them and make them successful, then it usually works. I want to switch gears for a second because we spent time on sales methodology, helping sellers while they're already you know, in the company to be able to be more successful, getting leadership buy-in on enablement programs. But one of the things that right now we, Vangresso, ourselves, and I can't even think of another organization that doesn't have this problem, is plagued with is really that uh, the onboarding, the ramp to productivity right? And you look back at your sales organization, the reality is, is, you know, most sales organizations that I've ever worked in, it's usually a six month long ramp minimum before you see some, some real good rep productivity. And in your legacy companies, like your fortune 100s, God, it could be even longer, right? Like we're talking like nine to 12 months. Now, of course, quota starts in month number three, usually in every organization, (laughs) sometimes even sooner. Or at least some sort of ramp quota, right? Yeah. The reality is, is most onboarding programs don't even match to where a seller should be and could be is supposed to be in order to be, you know, successful at selling out even at those levels. And that's a big problem. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why we see turnover at the 18 month process, right? Because the rep didn't get onboarded fast enough, quick enough, wasn't able to make an impact. So talk about bringing forward a, a world-class enablement onboarding program? Is it always boarding? (laughs) Or how do you ramp to productivity? What are some of the key elements to a successful enablement program to support that? Lots of people call me up and they ask me questions about, you know, onboarding programs that, you know, I've had a lot of success. And, you know, the the one that we built at ServiceNow actually won, you know, Serious Decisions Award for like best onboarding program of the year, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, there, there is a way. And I think most people, most of my colleagues, have a pretty similar approach to getting a 30, 60, 90 day onboarding program. You have to do you know, certain things, you know, hit certain milestones, et cetera. But I also look at the always boarding, which I'll touch a little bit on you know, in a minute. But the way I've looked at it, most enterprise sales organizations, I would say on average nowadays, it's around nine. They, they want to get it to seven or six. A lot of it is a function of average deal size and length of average deal. If you have a six to nine month sales cycle, then it's likely that you're going to have a longer ramp to productivity because stuff takes longer to happen. There's probably right. fewer transactions. So there's, there's less opportunities at, at bats to really get through. So you, you, know, you have to think about those things. What I've done is what are the things that we could do to accelerate ramp in two ways? What people look at, they, what they always look at are the traditional measures, right? Time to first deal, you know, my, our friends at Level Jump are, are experts at this. So if you guys in the audience don't know Level Jump, you should reach out to them because they, they're really good at this stuff. Time to first deal, time to second deal, time to first new logo, time to first, you know, kind of upsell of an existing account if you walk into a, a, not a new territory, pipeline coverage, activities. People look at that and how fast they're getting to that. And then, of course, 
revenue is important. So time to you know, your first quarter that you achieved the quarterly equivalent of your annual quota, right? So if my if I have a million dollar quota, the first quarter I hit two hundred fifty thousand dollars, then theoretically I'm ramped because now I can hit that trajectory. But I look at those things, but those are all lagging indicators, right? Because that tells you what happened. Now, how are you going to be able to predict how quickly they're going to be able to progress? So I look at time it takes for that rep to be capable of hitting their quota, not all the other lagging indicator measures. But so that's where the 30, 60, 90 becomes so important. And I've changed the focus about what do they need to know to what do they need to be able to do? So of course, you, there's stuff about the company, there's stuff about the product, the messaging. Are you going to record them doing an elevator pitch? Are you going to record them doing the first call deck and, and have a certification? I mean, there's, people have different of opinions around how stringent some of that stuff should be. But if you focus on the things that that salesperson has to be able to do in order to, to make quota, and you can accelerate that, and then you, you build the coaching around those things, then that's going to accelerate ramp. And just to make the math easy, if you have 100 reps and each of them has a $1.2 million quota and you have, there's always say 25% of them, you know, kind of ramping because of just attrition and stuff, 25 people. And if you can improve that ramp time by one month, that's 25 times $100,000. That's a lot of revenue that you can impact by just moving it by one month. There's real numbers to that if you just think about it, right? So that's the part that helps somebody be capable of ramping. And then you have to look at, are they actually delivering the results? Which then goes into the always boarding thing because people ramp at different rates. Some people get it faster than others. And so how are you going to continue to accelerate their ramping and their productivity? So you're always boarding them. You're always training them. That feeds into the broader enablement program that then changes the game on just ramp and ramp to productivity and onboarding to now I can start focusing on how many reps are at a hundred percent of their number period. Forget about when they ramped or what my ramp capacity is and all these other kinds of sales operational things that people look at. Now I can start focusing on when can I get them over a hundred percent? There's a lot of studies and you know, you mentioned it earlier that there's so many sales organizations that have such low percentage of people that are making the number. You could say, hey, well, they set quotas too high. They, you know, they, they put too much over achievement. And, and as long as the company makes it this number, nobody really cares how many people don't do or don't make it. But you want all of your reps. And wouldn't it be wonderful if every rep was at 100%? I mean, Theoretically, that's the way it should be. And if with over assignment of quota and so forth, then you'd be at, you know, 150% probably, right? Or close. Then, then this is where the psychology of the rep comes in. This is kind of what you alluded to also about the 18 month thing. The psychology of the salesperson is if I got to come in and I got to ramp and I know it's going to take me six months or so, and they're hoping it's going to be faster. Or maybe you say, Hey, they learned that it's seven to nine months and they're trying to get it to six. They start doing the, the math stuff in their head. They're in oh gosh, I'm struggling to get that first meeting. I can't get, I can't build enough pipeline. And that deal that I had, that was a, a, a renewal of a, an account that was already in my territory is just got pushed, you know, so that they're not making, they're, they're seeing zero revenue and they're not seeing the activity. Then they start falling into this, what I call trough of despair. Emotionally, they start thinking like, oh my God, did I make the right decision? Am I going to really right. make it in this company? Because they start out so excited. Hey, I'm glad to be here. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to make a lot of money, whatever. And then they start falling into this trough of despair. And then they start thinking about, well, you know what? That other company had called me when I came here. Maybe it, I can just, you know. Just go back to them. And I can go back to them. All of the positive energy they have left, they focus on getting a new job because they think they're going to get fired because they're not ramping fast enough, right? And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. There is a way that enablement teams can affect that in a positive way by just thinking about it differently. If you think about the old traditional ways, oh, I got to run a week-long boot camp and then I got to give them their, you know, their presentation and they got to pass this test and think about it differently about what are the things that they need to be able to do. And if you can accelerate that and get people to buy into this is going to help you be successful, then I've seen it work. In the last couple of companies I've been at, we've improved ramped by almost 40% by changing that thought, get on the board. You, know, you don't need to have your, if you have a guarantee, like why don't even worry about it. Just go sell. Don't use that as a crutch. 
and then showing them the things that they need to be able to do beyond what they just need to know and prove that, then they're off to the races. And as soon as they close that first deal, then the euphoria is even higher because they're like, yep, I can do it. I came here for a reason. It's the right reason. Now I've made a, a deal. I've got pipe. And then they're off to the races. Well, that is some good advice because there's a lot of sales leaders out out there that said, if I can just improve my onboarding, my ramp up time from one month, just by one month, how much more productive and revenue could they produce and, and actually even make their actual quota? And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, even here at Bingresso, in our first two full years of selling time, the first year, it was all of the founders, of course, that were doing the selling time. The second year, it was we brought on a sales team and we saw that it took us about 12 months to get these folks up to speed from a ramp. And our average sales time could be anywhere from a couple months to a year. We're working on one deal right now. We're going on two years as, as a sales opportunity time frame. That's abnormal. But on average, it's about six months, right? But to take 12 months to ramp somebody up, no, 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 you can't do that. And, and we're a small company, right? So we got in our own way. And that's when I think, talk about the list that we made of 2019 business blunders. Like this was a huge eyesore for us and being able to look at it and say, all right, we got to get out of our own way. We've got to start documenting processes and procedures and getting folks on board it so they can sell starting day number one. And you look at that, and for us, we looked at it and said, there's an infrastructure issue, meaning our systems and tools are not set up correctly to be able to support the seller. There is a process development issue in terms of getting them actually onboarded. And there is a methodology problem. You know, we know it. As an example, if you ask Kurt Shaver and myself, we know how to do this because we're the founders of the organization and we also are 20 year veterans, right? So we kind of have it in our DNA, but anybody else coming in, they may not have the industry expertise. They may not have the vertical expertise. They may not have the actual knowledge of the different tools that we use. For example, we use HubSpot. That was a huge learning curve from those that had used Salesforce. It yeah. was for me, right? So there's a whole lot of things that we had to go through. And I think if we can really master this one issue, one issue, you could really dramatically change the outcome of your sales organization. Look, we're almost out of time here. I want in a few minutes, just the next few minutes, I want to just talk about one of the things that oftentimes leaders that your fellow peer leaders, enablement leaders, and sales leaders are talking about is engaging consulting organizations, technology vendors. Talk a little bit about these particular organizations or vendors that you might use to augment and support your enablement programs and productivity goals. How do you look at them? How do you engage with these organizations to actually help support your enablement and productivity goals? And that's a good one. And I think it's underrated in terms of its importance of looking at it really, really critically because I've been around more years than I care to admit. And so all of the vendors, you know, you mentioned HubSpot, you know, and the CRM vendors, and then you have your seismics and your high spots and your show pads and all that stack. And then you've got your productivity, you know, like chorus and gong and, you know, these, there's a whole slew of different technologies that are, that are all over the place now that all espouse some great thing. Hey, just plug this thing in and it's going to improve this or it's going to take care of that. And the way I've always looked at it is, is really making sure you're understanding what problem are you really trying to solve? Because I have worked in organizations that didn't have those enablement platforms now that they're just being called for years and we're fine without it. Then there are companies that didn't have one and were so desperate to need one, but just weren't there from a maturity level, you know, yet. So I, I would always advise my colleagues to not be a, a bigot of any one of them because all of them have, just like the methodologies, all of them have something that makes them unique and interesting and really positive. And if that thing fits into your culture and your level of maturity as an organization really, really well, then maybe that's the one you need to go with or maybe not. So even if I like it personally and like the people there and I like working with them, that for this particular company, it's not the right fit. So using Vangresso as an example, I really wanted to work with you because of your approach and how that was going to fit in with what our company needs to be able to do but also knowing enough about my organization to know that if, if we go back to the other example of, hey, if I just wanted a two-day training class, yeah, you could do that, but that's not going to work long-term for us. So I wanted to make sure that I was working with a company that was going to fit in with the skill development, 
the system, the tool, the process, the reinforcement so that it was going to stick long-term. If I'm going to pay you, you know, a bunch of money, I want to make sure that we get the value from it that we want. And I know enough about my organization to know that a training thing isn't going to work at all. And it would be a waste of money. And we're still a relatively small company, so we don't have money to waste. You know, maybe other companies have, they can throw money at stuff and say, yeah, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Well, I don't have that luxury. And people do become friends with all these companies and this technology and think, oh, I'll just implement it over here. But that's not necessarily going to work. So have, you know, understand the business problem you're really trying to solve. What thing are we really trying to move the needle on it for this enablement program? And then find the vendor that fits that best and then work with that. And it's okay to start small. I've implemented lots of things where it's like, I know I'm not taking advantage 100% of this, but I know that if I tried the big bang, it's more likely gonna fall flat than be successful. And there's only a few credibility hits that enablement people can take of stuff getting messed up before they're like, right. they don't trust you anymore. And the next thing you try to do that, it's gonna like, you know, give you the Heisman and say, oh, sorry, I'm not listening. And I'll just do the, you know, or, or the, what's worse is they say yes. And then they give them what I call the pocket veto. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do that. And then they turn it off. Uh, no, don't worry about it. You don't yeah, right? exactly. Because that's, that's worse, right? So yeah. be really selective about when you do it. And it's okay to go slow, to go fast. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, Steve, and I'll just comment because you, you brought up, and by the way, for those of you listening in, I had no idea whether or not you were going to use us as an example. So I appreciate you doing that. Thanks for giving us that plug, Brad. I appreciate that. But what was interesting is going through the process with you, I'll, I want to describe to everybody on what the conversation and how Steve and I had worked together. And actually, Steve had done pretty much almost 70% of his homework by the time that he actually talked to me. And, and how we talked was we were at an event together, we met up, and then we spent a couple hours over dinner spending some time talking about what you were trying to do and where you were trying to go. But what was interesting is I had an informed buyer already, someone who would listen to the podcast, someone who saw our content, who even read and, and used some of our content with a sales organization. And then throughout the process, I remember you asked me was, what's the length of the program? I mentioned to you, it's over three months. Why is it like that? And then we, we went through how we do the university style learning program, right? It's self-paced textbook, AKA on demand, then live hands-on practical, then reinforced coaching. And then you said, fabulous. What happens after the three months? And then we went through that and we talked about how we support the sellers on an ongoing basis. And you're like, awesome. Like, so it was hitting all the points of what we had just talked about in terms of reinforced in this case, training program, an enablement training program. And then furthermore, you said, timeline, I wouldn't want to roll anything out until second quarter. And I was like, why so specific? I don't know if you remember. I was like, why, why? yes, okay, no problem. Why so specific? And it was like, if you look at all the different enablement programs, you were stacking them up over the course of the 2020 year and making sure that you can give what it is that the sales force can digest at the time that they can digest it. And I thought that was very insightful because oftentimes you talk to sales organizations or sales leaders and even enablement leaders. And it's like, when do you want to do this right now? We need to, we need to have an impact right now. Well, it was just like, okay, well, let's talk about what are all the other programs that you have going on right now so we can make sure we actually do it right now. <laughs> so, and, and, and that is a, a really good point. And that's, you know, again, to my enablement colleagues listening is I'm sure you all have a plan now for your 2020 enablement priorities. And, you know, they've got to fit into the broader sales organization priorities and business business goals, and then stick to it. I mean, I remember Steve Jobs always saying, it's not what you say yes to, it's what you say no to. And so be aware of that. And if those are your priorities, don't try to force something because again, if it falls flat, there's only a certain number of, of hits that you can take as an enablement person with your sales organization before they stop trusting you. That's always been the thing that I've fought hard for is, making sure that whatever we're going to do, that it's done with the right priority, with the right backing, with the right support from management in a way that we know we can roll it out, that the sales organization can digest and that we can reinforce it so that it sticks. Because otherwise, then you just become a training function. And then that's the you know slow road to death. Let me cap this off with how you went through the actual buying committee process. And I thought it was very interesting and it was very refreshing as well, because while you were the 
I would say not instigator. What's the better word? What you were the initiator. You were the initiator of what is the organization needing right now? Final buy off, not just from a cost perspective for a hundred sellers, right? But final buy off was: Do I have the CEOs and the CROs? And also the financial side of the house, right? Do I have these two, but these two key stakeholders, do I have their buy-in to make sure that they're going to support me, in this case, you, Steve Maxwell, to delivering on this new program? And whether it's a program, a technology, a process, a methodology, whatever it might be, do I have these two folks? And it was very insightful to watch you go through the process because what you did is what really what you've described, and that is making sure that you gain that sales leadership buy off and sign off that they're committed to the program and enhancing the skills of their selling community. In this case, the skills. And that was, I think, important because the, the people you left out were also marketing as well as. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Well That's as, right. As well as the, the team that was going to be, you know, kind of the, the SDRs that were going to be a big user as well. And to make sure that the, the leadership of all of those different functions who were either going to feed content, manage the team, ensure the buy-in and the reinforcement were all bought in in advance all the way up to the CEO. So I totally forgot about them. And that even makes the point even better. (laughs) So listen, we're coming to a close here. And if people want to get a hold of you, it was the best way. Are you on Twitter? Should they connect with you on LinkedIn? LinkedIn is best for me. So if they reach out to you, send, please, my friends out there listening in, please, please, please make sure you send a customized message to him and say you heard him on the modern selling podcast and that you enjoyed that particular program and then also steve i always ask this question of all my guests you know it because you've listened to all my podcasts we're coming up here i told you you had about 50 minutes or so so here's the question your all-time favorite movie what is it and as much as i knew that question was coming i've seen so many movies that i cannot pick one so you have to let me pick two one from the old school the Maltese Falcon, Humphrey Bogart, you know, just classic black and white noir film. Just unbelievable. One of my, it has to be, it's, a, it's one of my all time favorites, of course, is I, I wouldn't have said it. And the other is the more kind of recent. And that's probably not the first time, if I recall, the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, not the first one, I don't think but definitely the second one. All right, I love it. Well, for all of you listening in right now, that was my man, Steve Maxwell. Make sure you connect with him on LinkedIn and tweet some sports stats at him, especially if you're trying to sell to him on Twitter. But uh, that having been said, stay tuned for this very important message right now from the Modern Selling Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a rating and review on iTunes. I would appreciate it. Also, if you want to easily find our show, just go to themodernsellingpodcast.com. Hey, since you'll be on our site, be sure to check out our Modern Marketing Engine Podcast hosted by my co-founder and CMO, Bernie Borges. Thanks for listening in, and until the next episode, good selling.